freedom. And they were saying, give up, give up, and telling to the government. And then all the government leaders came in front of the government place, and they signed the paper, and peacefully our nation became free, free country, accepted democracy. So that's, I just thank God so much that this change peacefully happened. And after that, I remember on the TV, the, those people, Russians, went back home. They were saying happily goodbye and so happy smiles on TV. <laughs> and I don't know, they, they must be upset inside. Um, took everything back to Russia. So now, young generation, I mean, young Mongolians now try to take care, you know, lead the country. They have no experience. So after they left, economically, we actually just dropped down to zero. Like, we were so dependent on Russia, and they didn't teach us how to be independent, they didn't teach us how to be, I mean, Mongolians didn't learn how to use their resource they have. So nationwide, we, I remember we had this food stamp we would use. And every day we would go to a small grocery store and have one piece of bread, one piece of meat or something just to try to survive. And my parents both lost their job. And a lot of the whole town had just, there was this depression. And it's, it was middle of winter, I remember those days. And um, so I, I guess I was pretty hungry. Or when you go through tough things, you never forget, right? It's a good memory when you look back. And um, there, there was, a lot of people that then people were saying there was not much things left in the, the whole nation resource, food-wise, and only salt and alcohol left in a grocery counter. So government actually started giving alcohol to just to get over the depression and to build their stomach. So people really enjoyed the free alcohol, you know. And Russians are so good at <laughs> vodka thing. So they call it our Russian brothers, and they're more closer than Chinese. But God says, love your neighbor as yourself. So we need to learn to love our neighbors. And, but back in the days that alcohol really got over, it was like big floods, you know, over our nation. And um, unfortunately, that one of them, my dad, a lot of my cousins, I mean, my relatives, uncles and aunties, got into alcohol. A lot of families that went through that. And um, my dad, he is awesome, man. I love him, who he is in Christ's eyes. And God created him so beautiful. Uh, but as I was a little girl, uh, he began, he, you know, because of the depression, who knows, he got into alcohol so bad. And um, he would blame us as being a poor and living like this is our fault or my mom's fault. So as a child, I grew up in this household that's, I can't, it's hard to call it home, peaceful home, um, but we had no choice. And he would come home um, many days during our childhood that's drunk and we know when time gets so late, we know what's gonna happen. So we have to be ready, and especially in winter time. We pretend like we're, li we're sleeping so we would put on our warm clothes inside and cover up blanket, pretending we are sleeping. So when he comes, there's a big footsteps, you know, would come in, in my little heart. We just it's scared to death, but we just have to wait and we know what's going to happen because he would come and he would beat my mom first and the you know, little food we have. My mom is just my hero. She is so amazing lady and how she went through all those times. And so she would, you know, keep a little bowl of soup for him. And we didn't have the refrigerator at that time. So when he comes late, you know, the soup, all the juicy parts would gone. And on top, you know, it's kind of dried up a little bit, a little, got, you know, cold. And so he would just throw it and, you know, call it, what is, this is just a dog meat. I don't want to live like this. It's all your fault, it's all you guys' fault, and just beat, him, beat her so bad. And then he would come to us. My, I have two siblings, and my sister and my brother. So we would just tra treat it like, I don't know, nobody. Like, he would do anything to us, beat us one by one. And then the best thing we have to do is just run, 
stay by ourselves. So he would also kick us out of the home. So middle of winter, I had many experiences that I had to run. We sometimes forgot our shoes. There was no time to get our shoes. And run and just, you know, save ourselves and knock on a relative's door. Please let us come in. And, and what, sometimes he would kick, chase us. And we have to hide ourselves just underneath a bed or anything. And those nights were so hard to go through. And as I grew up, now I'm becoming a teenager, I wonder in my heart, so how in the world I became a daughter of this man? Can I, uh, why couldn't I have this nice man and that nice father in my life? So as hearing that, I thought, okay, this is my fault, the reason why my dad is living like that. But in my little brain, you know, I thought, okay, I want to do my best. I don't want to live like my parents. So do my best at school. So I studied best I could, became one of the top students. And that really didn't change anything. And I would bring my reward to my dad, and he would look at it many times. And um, one thing he told me that really discouraged me, he said, what is this? This is just a piece of paper. And all these my trying and hoping, okay, this is what might help my dad to stop drinking. That, but that's not helping. So I came to the point, so why am I living for? And if this can't change, so what's the reason of my life? I don't want to live anymore. That I just don't, can't go through this again. That we would beaten and go run away a few days, and my mom would go back. And the life cycle just keeps on and on. And I just couldn't understand it. And Many times I asked my mom, why are you going back? This will be same again. So later my mom said, I had no choice. I didn't want you guys to live or ended up on the street and no place to go. So he, she had no choice. She has to go, had to go back. And then I grew up one point when my dad would just all these lies of the enemy, you know, it's amazing how enemy uses. And, to destroy our loved ones. And family is so important in God's heart. But when you love somebody, your loved one tells you something really bad. It hurts more than somebody strangers tell you something, right? So that enemy really uses that. And all these lies, you know, you're not worthy, you're not beautiful, you're just the ugliest person or whatever those lies. It's just so hard to bury. I mean carry that over and I came to the point that I thought, okay, I'm just going to go to the drugstore and I'm going to buy this sleeping pill. <laughs> I want to just go. And so I went to this store and right before I came, it closed. I was so disappointed, but today I'm so thankful. <laughs> it was God's plan. And he had so much for, for me and for all of us too. So that day, I mean, right after that, it's amazing. I think God heard my cry. Um, my school principal came. It's 1998. I was 14 years old. He came to my home with bicycle. My home is like edge of the town. And he showed up middle of nowhere. It's middle of summer in July, and school is not working. And I was like, what are you doing here? I didn't ask him, but I was surprised. <laughs> to see him, and she said, Inkush, where are your parents? And I told him, I was washing window. I told him they are inside, and thankfully my dad wasn't drinking. So he talked to my parents. He said, tomorrow you have to send your daughter to this English camp. We chose 10 you know, good students from our town, and um, it cost $10. You have to pay for that. And he left. So it was 5 in the evening, next day, 11 at night, I mean 11 in the morning, I have to be ready. So my parents could not say no, because he's a school principal. And even though they didn't have money to you know, pay for the fee and nice clothes for me to change, but my, um, <laughs> my dad has like 14 siblings, my mom has 13 siblings, so I had relatives all over my town. <laughs> so my mom was like, she, they just ran into different villages and they collected some nicer clothes for me to change so make, I would look better, you know, a little bit better for a few days. <laughs> and then they borrowed some money. 
So uh, back in the days, she would make like $20 a month. But July, she doesn't work. It was vacation, school vacation, holiday, or not holiday, vacation. Um, so they, we don't have any income coming. And we would dry meat. Uh, we use intestines of the animals except pigs. So we would dry our meat, and then um, uh, the summer, those summers, like a lung part, that's most, a lot of, most of the people don't like it, but this is the last part we would eat because we have no choice. <laughs> My job was like to pound it, so make it like really cool powder, and um, so then we make soup or anything we want and, and different kinds of meal out of it. So, then my parents borrowed some money from friends and family. So next day, I was ready at the train station. And um, 10 of us with the teacher, we hopped on the train. About 45 minutes, uh, we got to this, uh, this really old Russian army truck picked us up. And it's on a really bumpy dirt road. <laughs> we, we made it to this camp. So at the camp, it's my first and last camp I ever had in my childhood. And I always wanted to be at the camp, but my parents said, if you study, you know, like A or excellent, we'll send you. Never happened in seven years. They didn't have money or they couldn't afford it. It's always like, a, now I kind of forgot about it, but I'm so thankful God knew the desires of my heart. So I was able to go to this camp. When we got there, the teacher, the camp leader said, sorry, we can't have you because it's already full. Because we have this amazing American teachers coming and teaching English. That's like, you know, morning star. I don't know. It's like you, you can't have this chance that often. So a lot of we 